Take out our Bibles. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Tonight I'll be reading a lot of scripture too, because I want to show you from the Bible these different points. In fact, we're going to read three verses right now before we even start the message. But 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 9. With that thought in mind, I mean, people can learn how to do things, but getting along with other people, that's an important quality that's needed and necessary. If you don't have that, you can learn all the other things, but it makes it difficult. You're not a, well, a good employee or someone that can't, can't get along with people and so forth. There's a problem there. But 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9 says, uh, For we are laborers together. For we are we, our laborers are working together. Now, with God also. Amen. So we all work together with, with God also. That's kind of uh, the way it works. Us, others, and God. Ye are God's husbandry. Okay, ye are God's building according to the grace of God, which is given unto me. Now turn to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew 25, verse number 34. How God used it. Why God doesn't just take us to heaven when we get saved? Because he has purpose for us here, different purposes. Uh, like I say, there's, well, nine, nine points. I'll get to maybe about five of them tonight. But Matthew chapter 25, dealing with this subject again, our relationship with other people. Matthew chapter 25, and verse number 30, beginning verse number 34. Excuse <coughs> me. Then shall the king say unto them on the right hand, Come. Ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. The kingdom. For I was a hungry, ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me to drink. I, I was a stranger, and ye took me in naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous end answer, the kind of perplexed questioning, then the righteous answer and say, Lord, no, excuse me, when saw we thee and hungered and, and fed thee and our thirsty gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in or, or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison came unto thee? They're saying to the Lord, I don't, I don't, I never did this. I don't remember doing any of this. Now, verse 40, and the king shall answer and say to them, verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Unto me. And then he talks about the other side to the other group. Heavenly Father, please help me as I preach tonight, uh, talking about your purposes for us, Lord, in this world. And why you don't just take us to heaven. You don't just take us to heaven. There's reasons, purposes that you want to use us, even in this time. This age in which we live. Help me to preach, Lord. Please help me to preach tonight. In Jesus' name, I pray and ask it. Amen. Amen. Now, if you would turn to 2 Corinthians chapter number 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Still dealing with this subject. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse number, well, beginning verse chapter 7. Get there, once you get there, I'll tell you which verse to turn to. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, beginning verse 5. Five. Notice the connection here. People, be, uh, people working together, people together here. This kind of goes along with it. You have to look into it, think about it a little bit. But I, I see it here too. Paul was encouraged by other Christians. Yeah. Paul was encouraged by other Christians. You know, God blesses us, yes, but we need to be encouraged by other Christians. Yeah, yeah. Other, other Christians should encourage us. In fact, we should be encouragement to other Christians ourselves too. This works back and forth. And that's what's happening here in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, beginning of verse 7. Beginning of verse 5. It says, For when we were come unto Macedonia, Paul says, when we got to the city of Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. And without their fightings, they had their battles. Within were fears. Even Paul had some fears, some uh, fears about things going on, what was going to happen. Verse 6. Nevertheless, God... The Lord always makes a big difference. Now, God that comforted those that are cast down, comforted us. How, how does God, how did God comfort the Apostle Paul here? How did God comfort him? He sent somebody. Yes. By the coming of Titus. See, God comforts us through other Christians. Amen. God comforts Christians through other Christians. Amen. That's what happened here in verse 6. 
Nevertheless, God had come to those that are cast down, covered us by the coming of Titus, and not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you. But Paul said how they handled uh, Titus there at, at, this, at this church here. Uh, that comfort, that made him feel good too. Uh, this is a good church over there. Wherewith he was comforted in you. So I was comforted by him, he was comforted by you. We're comforting each other here. That's one of the reasons we need each other. Amen. To comfort each other. Amen. When he told of us your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me, when Paul said he heard what their attitude was towards me, how that encouraged him, comforted him, helped him, encouraged him, so that I rejoiced some more. Because in verse number 8, he continues on, he had to deal with something very, very serious there. He had to deal with a situation they needed to change, they had to correct. And he was worried about, he was kind of stressed a little bit, worried about how they would handle it. What their reaction would be, what their attitude would be there. And when he found out everything is great at the church, and they handled it the right way, and everybody's getting along, he was so glad to hear that. He was so glad to hear that Christians were getting along there in that situation, because he did have to deal with some serious things. Serious things. Well, let's talk about that tonight now. Uh, I'm going to bring up probably five, I can probably get to five points tonight. People's purposes. God's purposes for people. Point number one, God uses us to teach others to be teachers. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. 2 Timothy 2, 2. Some people, I don't know if you ever thought about some basic Christianity things. Why do we have Sunday school class? Or why do we have a Sunday school time? Why do we call? Why do we have teachers? Now, I know we're down in kids. We don't have many kids at all. And I, 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 you know how much that bothers me, too. Uh, but we do have teachers ready to teach Amen. all the time. Of course, I teach. Brother uh, Jeffrey teaches at times. Brother Brown Powell teaches. Uh, others may be coming up. They'll be teachers, too. We'll see how that works out. But teachers, we need teachers. Second Timothy chapter two, verse two. That's a job for Christians is to teach. To teach. Some people don't understand this, and they say, "Well, I don't need any teachers. I don't need the church. I'm just going to read the Bible. I can worship God by myself. I can learn by myself. I don't need teachers." Well, they don't understand what the Bible teaches. Do they? they don't understand that. Verse two, Second Timothy two two, and the things that thou hast heard of me, Paul's writing to Timothy. Among many witnesses, what you've heard me teach, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. So we're to be teachers, learn how to be good teachers. Another verse that talks about teaching uh, is in Titus chapter 2, verse 1. Turn there just forward a little bit. Titus chapter 2, verse 1. Beginning of verse 1. Teachers, we need to teach. And if God's called us to teach, logically that means there must be somebody who needs to learn. Imagine if you went to school and you were called to be a teacher. You went to some classroom in some school and they already paid you some money. And you went there and no students ever showed up. You know, that's a waste of time. That, that's not real. No, if God's called teachers, then there must be those that need to learn. Titus chapter 2, verse 2, 1 says, But speak to other things which become sound doctrine. That the aged men, now here we go, aged. The word aged can be used twice here. One for the men and one for the ladies. But the men are to learn from the men and the women are to teach the young ladies. The aged. Don't take that as an insult. The word aged there means more than just old. It also means experience. And wise is what that means there. That the aged men be sober. Not talking about alcohol, but in control of your emotions. Brave, temperate, sound in faith, and charity and patience. And now verse 3 talks about the ladies, too. Amen. Uh, the younger ladies need to learn from the older ladies. Amen. Right. And ladies, I apologize again. You are called aged here. But that doesn't mean old. It just means wise and experienced. Good. The aged women, That's right. likewise, in the same way. So men should be teaching men, especially women and women. That's right. That they be in behavior as becometh holiness. The older ladies, the experienced ladies, the spiritual-minded ladies, uh, the well, spiritual-minded ladies, should teach the young ladies how to be holy. Amen. Well, I can wait. I can spend a little time on that, couldn't I? How to be holy? Yeah. Holy, not flirtatious, not uh, well, to be holy. You know what I'm getting at here? Yeah. 
to be holy Amen. in their decor, be holy in how they're dressed, be holy in how they act. Uh, like, older ladies need to teach the younger ladies how to be holy. Amen. That's right. How to be holy. That's right. I'm glad I have a wife. There's yeah. there's many ladies in our church that yeah. set a good Christian example. Yeah. They really yeah. do. Yeah. A, lot, a lot of ladies in our church. I'm so glad about that. Because yeah. you go to some churches and they don't see a lot of that, right. if anything at all, sometimes. Yeah. As behaviors become with holiness. So like older ladies, you have to be able to teach the younger ladies how to be holy. Amen. That's your responsibility. That's one of the callings God has called you to be a teacher. Amen. So great. The ancient women, likewise, that they need behaviors become the holiest. Not false accusers. Don't lie about things or make up stories about people. Not giving much wine. Again, we're not talking about alcohol. We're talking about less, more than that. Not much wine means not to be drunk at all. If you want to get into deeper study, it means Christians should not drink any alcohol beverage at all. Amen. That's what that really means. Amen. Amen. Teachers of good things, teachers of good things, not only to warn the younger ladies, but also teach good things. That they may teach the young women. That they may teach the young women. Amen. Yes, sir. To what? To do what? To be sober. Yes. In control of your emotions. Good. That's good. Right. To love their husbands for those who are married. Younger ladies who are married to love their husbands, to love their children. Yeah. That's, you know, abortion comes to mind. Why does it come to mind that way? To love their children, some of them will abort their baby. Oh, that's certainly not loving their children. That's right. Couldn't be more opposite. Well, let me hurry on. I'm, I'm really in the talk of the mood tonight. I don't, I don't know if that's good or bad. We'll find out as we go on tonight. All right, so what else are the aged women, the older women, the experienced women, the wise? Spiritually wise ladies will teach the young ladies. Yes, Verse 5, 5 continues, to be discreet. Mm -hmm. Have discretion. Know what to say or know what not to say. Yeah. Don't want to keep your mouth shut. Be discreet about things. Not to insult people. Right. Not to hurt people's feelings. Be discreet. Careful about what you say. Discreet. That word discreet is important to have discretion. As a jewel of gold and a swine snout, so is a fair woman which is without discretion. Remember that verse? Proverbs chapter 25, verse 17 is it? As a jewel of gold and a swine snout. Uh -huh. You talk about a funny illustration. As a jewel of gold and a swine snout, so is a fair woman which is without discretion. Yeah. I remember I said years ago as a young Christian, I don't know why, I just liked it. Yeah. And it's still there, it's still in my mind. Alright, verse 5. To be discreet, chaste, yeah, chaste. Keepers at home, don't go wandering around. Uh, good, just basically good. Jesus went around doing good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God, the word of God be not blasphemed. Yeah. We think about blasphemy as somebody cursing and using the Lord's name as a curse word. But to blaspheme, to go against any of these, the Bible says here, this is blasphemy. Because mm -hmm. you claim to be one thing and believe in one thing, but you're living another way. And then young men, okay, young men now, back to the went to we went to the men, to the ladies, and young men likewise, exhort to be sober-minded. Yeah, so the older Christians need to set the right kind of example. Ladies, uh, again, we need to, you need to set the right example. Men, we need to set the right example. Amen. Sometimes you don't even need to say anything. Right. Yeah. Just set the right example right. yourself. Amen. People pick up on that. They're convicted about it. And then verse 7, in all things, show yourself a pattern of good works. A pattern of good works. That's your habit. The word pattern is habit. Good works. In doctrine, showing on corruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned. Every word coming out of your mouth is right. Good words. That ye he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed. Having no evil thing to say of you. And believe me, they are looking. Yep. Yeah. They are looking to find something criticized. And they can look and they can look and they can look and find nothing. It frustrates them. Isn't that humorous? I mean, they're trying to find something wrong with you, and they can't find anything wrong with you. I find that kind of humorous. So number one, teaching, teaching. Older people may be old, but believe me, experience, experience means a lot, too. Yeah, yeah. And the more you know the Bible, the Word of God. Amen. So men need to set the right example and teach and counsel men. Ladies need to set their elder ladies, aged ladies, wise ladies, spiritual ladies need to set the example there for the younger ladies, too. So teach others. That's one of the reasons God left us here. Paul was a teacher. He preached and he taught. Both those things. So number one, to teach others. Teach others. And don't be a 
offended by that word aged, it means a lot of good things. Aged men, aged ladies. All right, number two, and this one I almost could build a whole message on just by itself, where God uses us to sharpen other people. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 17. I think a lot of you know this verse already. Proverbs 27, verse 17. So God uses us to teach others, and also God uses us to sharpen other countenances. To sharp. It's like a, a, a knife. You have a dull knife, you need to sharpen that knife. Yeah. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to do a good a job as you would get a sharp knife. A sharp knife just cuts so much cleaner, so much quicker, so much easier. Yeah. A sharp knife does. Proverbs 27, verse 17. And then we're going to look at the verse in Ecclesiastes 2, which yeah. I think yeah. is interesting. Yeah. Proverbs 27, verse 17. That's a pretty well-known verse here. Iron sharpeneth iron. To make people sharper spiritually, to kind of get the rust off, uh, kind of get rid of the, all the corrosion that might come out of the knife or something, but iron sharper than iron. And this happens between people. Uh, it talks about a man in particular, but this is true for ladies also. Iron sharper than iron, so a man sharpened the countenance of his friend. Hey, yes, yes, yes. Friends. Friends uh, sometimes debate different thoughts back and forth, and sometimes they have different opinion on things, and that can happen. Uh, but generally, if you're open to what the Bible says, you're going to be better off after those kind of situations. Because you're going to learn some things you, you needed to learn. Our iron is sharper than iron. Some of those rough spots will be rubbed off. Some of those rough spots are going to be turned into sharp, I guess sharp spots, you could say. But iron is sharper than iron. As a man sharpened the countenance of his friend. It's a good thing. It's a good thing to kind of talk about things, talk about doctrine. Sometimes false doctors can come into churches that need to be dealt with, and, and people need to be taught with in times or counseled, and, and uh, that's why we teach sometimes on things. That's why I preach sometimes on things. But iron sharper than iron, so man sharpened the countenance of his friend. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Good. According to the Bible, what is that? That's a good thing. Amen. That's a good thing. Now I want you to turn to Ecclesiastes Amen. chapter 10. Ecclesiastes chapter 10. So, number one, to teach others, watch who you're learning from. That's right. Make sure you learn from the right ones. Amen. Number two, Amen. that your countenance has been sharpened. Ecclesiastes chapter number 10 and verse number 10. It says here, if the iron, we talk about iron, sharpened iron, if the iron be blunt, and he do not wet the edge, sharpen it, then must he put to more strength. If things aren't sharpened and made right, sharpened here, then it's going to cause a more of a problem. It's going to take more effort. There's going to be more problems involved. It's take more effort than to get a job done. That's right. The time spent sharpening things, sharpening your, I guess I'll say it this way, your spiritual knives, the time spent will save time much more time later. Yeah. Yeah. Get things right now yeah. where things need to be changed, with, yeah. where you might, need, you might need to be sharper, I might need to be sharper. Take care of it now. It takes a little time, take a little effort. But in the long run, it'll save a whole lot more time. Yeah. Yeah. And take a whole lot less effort later. That's why we need to teach people. Uh, if the iron be blunt and he do not wet the edge, then must he put more, the more strain. It's harder to cut the the bread if you don't have a sharp knife. It's hard to cut that piece of wood if you don't have a, a sharp saw. Take the time to sharpen the saw. Take the time to sharpen the knife. It'll be so much easier after that. You'll get a quicker job and a better job done. Amen. Sharpen the knife. Amen. Sharpen that uh, saw to put the more strength. But wisdom is profitable to direct. Okay, but you have a blunt knife, there's problems there. Sharpen, sharpen. Uh, Turn up to the New Testament, Titus chapter 1, Titus chapter 1, verse 13. Brother Jeffrey preached several verses from this in his message this morning. Amen. And I'm, I'm thinking, sitting here thinking, how oh, he's preaching my message. <laughs> no, I, I know it is. It was the introduction to my message tonight. Yeah, Brother Jeffrey's message this morning was the introduction to my message tonight. Amen. Titus chapter 1, verse number 3. Uh, let's see, Titus, I'm sorry, 3rd, verse 
verse 13. Titus chapter 1, verse 13. This witness is true. Wherefore rebuke them, and here's our word, sharply. Yes, yes. It's time people need to be confronted with different things. Right. Wherefore rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith. Amen. Now, who are we to rebuke sharply? Those that are not sound in the faith. Mm -hmm. Those that are not sound in the faith. That's what's talking about here. That subject here. For rebuke them. Now, sharply, it doesn't mean in a mean way or an ugly way, but it means make it clear. Amen. Make it sharp. Make it pointed, you might say. I uh, rebuke them sharply. That word sharp, I uh, thought such an interesting thing. It means to take off that, all the corrosion, take off all the rust, make things right again. Let's turn now back up to 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Yeah, a lot of verses tonight, I want to talk about this. God's purposes for people, we're to sharpen people in our church. Yes, yes. I'm glad you come out Sunday nights. There's a lot of sharpening goes on Sunday nights. 2 yes, yes. yes. Corinthians chapter 13, verse number 9. 9 and 10, they wait towards the end. For we are glad when we are weak and you are strong, and this also is even your perfection. Perfection. Therefore, I write these things, Paul says, I write these things, being absent. He says, I'm not there with you personally, I'm being absent. But lest being present, I should use sharpness according to the power which the Lord has given me to edification and not to destruction. Paul's showing a little of <coughs> The point he's trying to make here says, in a way, I'm glad I'm not there because if I was there, I might be too rough on you to the point of destruction. I don't want to do that. Paul says, I want to make sure I, I use my sharpness, bring up what's right and wrong according to the power that the Lord has given me the edification. He's given me that power, given me that anointing, and not to destruction. I don't want to teach things and edify things, make things sharper. And that will lead to some kind of destruction, some kind of harm. I don't want that to happen either. So Paul, in verse number 10, a very interesting little verse here in 2 Corinthians 13, 10. But talking about being sharp, sharpened people, the sharpened people. Since I'm just using up a lot of time anyway tonight, let's turn to Revelation chapter 14. Let's look at something sharp here in Revelation chapter 14. Okay. Yep. Revelation 14, the beginning of verse 14. <clears throat> What could you be talking about, Pastor? What sharp That's right. thing has been used in Revelation 14, 14? Revelation 14, beginning in verse 14. Uh, verse 14 here, 14, 14, Revelation. And I look, John says, and behold a white cloud, and upon the cloud one said like unto the Son of Man, and who was that? That's the Lord Jesus Christ. Having on his hand a golden crown, and in his hand a, a sharp sickle. I just find it interesting the word sharp is used here so much. A sharp sickle. Verse 15. Notice how many times the word sharp is used here. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat in the cloud, thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap the harvest of the earth is ripe. Talking about the last days. It's still future for us, too. This is still future for us. Verse 16. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in the sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Another, another angel, another angel came out of the temple, which is also having a sharp sickle. Right. They're going to do the job right, right with a sharp, not just a sickle, a sharp sickle. Verse 18. Look at verse 18. Another angel came out from the altar, which had uh, power over fire, and cried with a with a loud cry to him that had that sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, not the dull one. Yeah. <laughs> Thrust in thy sharp <laughs> sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine in the earth, and the grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the winepress, even unto the horse bridles by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. Sharp sickles. When God does a job, he does it with a sharp sickle. He does it with a well-tuned uh, weapon, with a well-tuned uh, piece of armor. So we need to kind of rub off on each other, iron sharper than iron. We need to, we need the sharp sickle ourselves, as the Lord's going to use that in Revelation 14, verse 14, as we just read there. In 2 Corinthians 13, number 9, we talked about it there too. Titus 1, 13, sharp, Amen. sharp. We see a lot of blunt churches around. 
What area? Of faith. People need to be re rebuked sharply, sharply in the area of spiritual things, Christian things, faith. This witness is true. Whoever rebuked them sharply, clearly that means, clearly don't, uh, <coughs> don't make it foggy, but clearly, that they may be sound in the faith. And then it continues on, verse 14. Not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth unto the pure. All things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and believe is nothing pure. So all of their kind of beliefs and philosophies, there's even more immorality involved in that. There's wrong things involved in that. Bad motives involved in that. And unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. Their mind is defiled, their conscience is defiled. And then our favorite verse, one of our favorite verses here, they profess that they know God, but it works. They deny it. Right. Being abominable and disobedient and every, up to every good work, reprobate. So to rebuke, to rebuke means to show that where they are wrong, show what they're doing wrong. 2 Timothy chapter 4, it's back up a little bit there. 2 Timothy chapter 4, to rebuke. That's our job, to express a judgment concerning what is wrong. So it can be set straight. Good. Said right. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. It says there, preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, with all long suffering and doctrine. Amen. Let's go back. It does verse 2 again. Preach the word. Yep. Preach means more than teaching. That's right. Preaching means really applying it in such a way. Teaching is important, but preaching the word is different from teaching. Yeah. Yeah. I guess my favorite definition uh, is Brother Roy Thompson's definition between uh, distinction between teaching and preaching. He says preaching is loud teaching. <laughs> and I always like that definition. Preach the word. Preach the word. Preach it like you're blowing, you know, playing a trumpet. You know, yeah. preach the word of God. Amen. We're not just here in conversational tone. I want to see somebody get a little excited about a little doozy about their own message. Yeah. But if a preacher can't get excited about his own message, what does that tell you about him? Right. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. It means all the time. It doesn't matter how you feel about it. Reprove, a big rebuke. There's our word, rebuke. Exhort with all unsubbing doctrine. We need to rebuke. I think it can be done tactfully. Right. I think it needs to be done with the right motive. But you know something? Yeah. Even if it's the wrong motive, I think it's still all right. Yeah. Does that sound strange? If people are doing something wrong, I, I want them to know about that. Amen. If they're doing something wrong, because wrong things never have good consequences. Right. Wrong things, wrong attitudes never have right consequences. Right. If you're doing the wrong thing, it's never going to lead to a good thing. Right. That's right. Right. There's, there's, no, there's no blessings, there's no positiveness about sin. No, right. none at all. Amen. So what, did God, what were God's purposes for people to teach other people? Uh, the men, the men, the ladies, the ladies, especially the younger ones, the new Christians especially, right. to sharpen our, each other's right. countenance so we'll get things right, get things right, keep things right. Number three, to rebuke people when they need, are doing something wrong. They're doing something wrong. Uh, let them know about them. To rebuke them. It doesn't have nothing to do with anything, doing anything good, just when they're doing something wrong. Some churches are really turning from that too, aren't they? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Let's bring up one more thought tonight here. The next one is to exhort. To exhort. It means to encourage, to challenge, to cheer them on, to exhort somebody. Since we're in 2 Timothy, just turn back to 1 Timothy, chapter 6 and verse 2. Now, Christian, this is for us. We're to, we're to do these things and we're also to benefit from these things. We're to teach, we're to sharpen our consciences, we're to uh, rebuke when that's needed and when it's right, too. We're to exhort each other also more in a positive line there. To rebuke, to rebuke, to exhort means to rebuke in a positive direction. Yeah. To rebuke, I'm sorry, to exhort means to rebuke, but in a positive direction. Kind of the opposite of rebuking. Now we're exhorting people to do what's right. So re, or, uh, rebuke means don't do that. Stop doing that. Uh, exhort means start doing this. Amen. Stop doing what's wrong. Start doing what's right. Amen. Rebuking and exhorting right here. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 2. And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them, okay, uh, because they are, uh, 
because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved partakers of heaven. These things teach and exhort. Teach and exhort. Teach people, exhort people to do the right things. Exhort them. So rebuking is saying, this is wrong, stop doing that. Exhorting means, here's what you need to start doing. To challenge them to go in the right direction. To rebuke in a positive direction. I thought that was an interesting definition. To rebuke somebody in a positive direction. That's what exhorting is. Turn to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians. Or back up to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And verse 11. Yeah, God uses us. But it's a lot. I think about these things. Now, sometimes I can be overwhelmed with the responsibility. Not just as a pastor, but just as a regular Christian. What God has called me to do. What God wants to use me. God's purposes for people. And I'm one of those people. Now, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse number 11. As you know, well, let's back up to verse 10. Yeah, we'll just go back to verse 10. Paul says here in this church at Thessalonica, Ye are witnesses, so you sing this yourself, Paul says, and God also, how holily and justly and unbelievably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. Verse 10, Paul says, you see that, you see my lifestyle, you see the way I live, God himself. Like people say, God is my witness. Don't ever say anything like that lightly either. Be That's careful right. with that. That's but here witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and blamably we behave ourselves among you that believe. And, and as you know, how we exhorted and comforted, there's the word exhort, we exhorted and comforted and charged Every one of you, as a father, God, his children. We exhorted, comforted, and charged. We gave the charge. Here's what you need to do. But they exhorted them to stop doing this, start doing that. Amen. God's purposes for Christians are to do all these things to each other. Yes, yes. God's not going to send any angel out of heaven to do these things. Uh, God's not going to cause the Apostle Paul to rise from the dead and come out to our church here and, uh, and tell us these things. We're to do these things amongst ourselves here. Now, in the right way, this can't be misused. This can't be done the wrong way, too. People can say, well, I'm doing this for your good. I'm just, be, be careful of that also, I know. Amen. We're going to stop there tonight. Amen. God's purpose is for people to teach each other. Amen. Amen. To sharpen each other's countenance. When people start going the wrong way, to kind of sharpen things up. When it starts to get a little blunt. Yes, like I thought this morning as I got up here after Brother Jeffrey preached a good message this morning. Amen. I got up here and I, we were talking about um, backsliders. I mentioned backsliding. And I thought, yeah, Lord, help those who don't know their backslid. Right, yeah, right. To know their backslid. Good. That's a sharpening there, isn't it? Mm -hmm. A sharpening. Number three, to rebuke. And yeah, when they're doing something wrong, that needs to be confronted with. He's be confirmed with rebuke and then to exhort, but to encourage along in the right love, the right way too. The right way. So God's purpose is for people. God's not going to do this directly. He's going to do these things through us, through us as Christians. Good. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Yes. And Lord, the responsibilities here sometimes, Lord, to me seem overwhelming. Uh, I don't see perfection. I'm desiring that. I want to be better all the time, Lord, a better pastor. Better Christian, better witness in so many areas. So Lord, forgive me where I've failed. Forgive us where we've done those things wrong to Lord. And thank you for 1 John 1 9. But I pray that I'll take these responsibilities and understand how important it is. Our influence and how you want to use us in this world. Thank you, Lord, for that. Great responsibility. Help us be worthy of us. Help us to be more sanctified and be more conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is perfect in all these things. Lord, just bless now as we have a time of invitation, we have a time of singing and prayer, maybe even someone walking the aisle this evening too, we pray for that. So please bless now, use this special time also, in Jesus' name we pray and ask it, amen.